In 1935, the reigning world chess champion Alexander Alyekin and Max Ova contested an exciting match that features our number two best chess game of the entire decade. At the outset of the match, Alyekin was considered such a favorite that even though he lost this match, I think that Ova's record as champion has been somewhat undercut ever since. He's often considered a lesser champion in my opinion, very wrongly, in light of his many great games, great writings about the game, and contributions off of the board. In the initial games, Alyekin took a strong early lead, winning three of the first four games. However, this was a long match, ultimately going 30 games, so there was absolutely opportunity to catch up. By the time of this game, the 26th game, Ova actually had a one-game lead in the match. After this game, the Pearl of Zandvoort, he had a two-game lead and things were essentially over. Although Alyekin won one more game, he could not hold on to his World Chess Championship title. After pawn to d4, we see the flexible move pawn to e6, but after c4, we see the committal move pawn to f5, the Dutch defense. Now, there's a lot that can be said about playing the Dutch against a Dutch player, but if you're looking for a dynamic game in a match where you're down, maybe this is a good opening choice. I think most modern players would take a more professional tact though and say, all right, I'm not going to be pushing too hard as black. I'll be okay with a draw, not play something risky like the Dutch, and I'll try to get my wins with white. However, that's not what Alyekin does. F5 it is. Now, g3, bishop to b4 check, an interesting move played often in the early days of the Dutch, and after bishop to d2, instead of trading, the bishop pulls back and says, eh, your bishop's not so great on d2, so this is probably fine for me. Now, bishop to g2, knight to f6, knight c3, castles, knight f3, and now knight to e4. All very reasonable play so far, kind of typical of the classical Dutch. Now, with the knight on e4, there are kind of two ideas available to black, and after castles, he can pick between them. One is to go for a stonewall structure with pawn to d5 not selected, and the other is to go for pawn d6 and bring this knight around to support the knight on e4. Both give black a decent, if probably somewhat worse position, but this is the most theoretically correct way to play this today. However, Alyekin goes for pawn to b6. It makes a lot of sense to put this bishop on the long diagonal, support the knight on e4, and just generally have the bishop lined up with all of your pawns, which are also controlling light squares. However, bringing the bishop around in this way can be punished. There are a number of issues, and one is apparent after the possible knight takes e4. After pawn takes knight e5, this pawn comes under a lot of pressure. It's going to need this bishop support, and ultimately, it's going to need this pawn support. But after d5, this bishop gets blocked a little bit, and this pawn is weak. White can play bishop h3 with a very, very large positional advantage. Now, Ova doesn't go for this, and I don't really know why, but I wonder if maybe he wasn't trying to get too much out of the opening as he was leading in the match. Instead, he just plays queen c2, putting pressure on the knight. We get bishop to b7, knight to e5. Now, d5 was interesting at this point, and knight takes c3. So, Ova hasn't really maximized his opportunities, but he's still safely better, which suits the match situation. Bishop takes c3, bishop takes g2, king takes g2, and queen c8. A little bit odd, queen e8 is kind of more normal, but the queen is looking to come to the long diagonal. At this point, Ova pushes maybe the wrong pawn in the middle of the board. Probably best is just pawn to e4. This pawn center can be supported very, very well, and white has a very large advantage. Instead, though, we get the more dynamic d5, which is very, very interesting. It leads to a fun game, and we do like that but it's also creating some weaknesses and probably isn't the best move in the position. After d6, the best move, the knight must fall back, and black plays e5 with a good pawn presence. However, this is also a position that's slightly better for white. Maybe not the clear advantage he could have gotten in other lines, but stably better. King h1, anticipating the fact that the g-file might be of relevance later on, really farsighted from Ova, and now we get pawn c6 trying to attack the center, queen b3 supporting it, king over to h8 stepping off a very dangerous diagonal. And now I really, really like the next move. I encourage you to pause your video and fight, try to find the strong positional idea that's played in the game. Well, the move selected is pawn to f4. 
And I love this move. In fact, the computer says this is probably still equal, but I don't think so. And the more you let the computer think after the following sequence of moves, which seems to be best, the more you see that white does seem to have a significant advantage. And I really think that both players sense that pressure here in the position. Now, because of the pressure on e5, you need to push forward with e4, which certainly opens this bishop up, which can now be very strong. The knight should move. Obviously, it's under attack here on d3. So it goes to b4, which looks a little bit weird. You're putting pressure here. And of course, black's never going to take here and make you uh, give you a strong knight. So pawn c5 pushing the knight back and the knight goes to c2 and doesn't look so great. But after knight d7, knight e3, the knight has made an excellent journey. On e3, the knight is beautiful. It's pressuring the f5 pawn, which makes it hard to put a piece on the f6 square. And there's a simple idea. Rook g1 and pawn g4, opening up the g file to white's advantage and making the long diagonal very, very strong. This is an excellent idea. And I think that even if the computer can maybe defend black's position, I think both players felt that black was in real trouble here. And I think that Al Yekin's next move indicates some desperation. Bishop f6, allowing white to take the pawn on f5 but white will have to sacrifice a piece to do so. After due consideration, Ova does go for it. Knight takes f5, a brilliant move. Now, bishop takes c3 as the point because there's a discovery on the knight on f5. I wonder if Al Yekin was willing to play this even though he probably knew that this wasn't good for him because it's definitely a dynamic game and at some point you need to find a game where you're playing for all possible results when you're down in a match. So after bishop takes e3, we get knight takes d6, hitting the queen, and the queen needs to move and attack the knight. Otherwise, on the next turn, white will just take the bishop and have a winning position. You can't move the queen to c7 because of knight b5, and white just takes the bishop on the next turn with two extra pawns. So the only move is queen b8, attacking the knight from a safe square. Now, knight takes e4. At this point, of course, the bishop is going to fall back, bishop f6, and the dust has settled a little bit. Now, white has three pawns for the piece, and they are strong central pawns. The knight simply needs to move out of the way on the e4 square, and the pawns can march up the board, and they will just be an undeniable force in this position. Of course, though, Al Yekin is not going to allow things to become so easy for his opponent. After knight d2, we see pawn g5, fighting for counterplay. And of course, if the position's open, uh, if the position opens and the pawns don't make progress up the board, then things can definitely turn around very, very quickly. G5 is an excellent move. E4, pushing forward, making sure the pawns do become strong in the center. Pawn takes F4, pawn takes F4. The open G file is certainly to black's advantage as black seeks counterplay. Bishop D4, the knight's looking, or the bishop is looking great on D4, and E5. Now, at this point, if you wanted to try to bail out as black, you might have been able to consider knight takes e5, giving a piece back here and saying, all right, I'll be down a pawn in this position, but maybe it's not so bad. After all, your king is really open. Can you win this position? I think, though, that this is still a very good position for white. Knight f3 is a strong move, and white has moves coming up like queen d3, um, and generally white seems to have a very large advantage. White also has ideas to bring the knight around to f7, and it will be the black king and not the white king that is in trouble. So after e5, pieces are kept on the board. Queen over to e8. The queen is obviously coming around to dangerous squares. And e6, attacking the knight on d7. And of course, Al Yekin ignores the attack on the knight on d7. He's seeking counterplay. It's his strong suit. Rook over to g8. He is the first one to occupy the g file with a rook. And of course, with his bishop on d4, it's not possible for white to contest that rook, or it seems not possible anyway. At this point, you cannot take the knight here on d7. If pawn takes d7, then black wins with queen e2. The invasion on the second rank attacks the knight, and it also threatens queen to g2, checkmate. It's over for white at this point. Now, 
After knight f3, black does get some counterplay. Probably stronger was knight to e4, a better post for the knight, and now the queen would have access to the third rank, which is going to help out in a lot of lines. White is much, much better there. But in the game, knight f3 is played, and suddenly Al Yekin does have counterplay. Queen to g6, threatening mate here on g2. You can play moves like knight g5 and even knight h4 here, but black has good counterplay and should be able to hold the game after those moves. White's pieces are a bit disorganized. Instead, Ovid decides to contest the g-file even at the cost of the exchange. Rook g1. After all, the bishop on d4 is one of the strongest pieces on the board, so getting rid of it for a rook while keeping all of your pieces strong makes some sense. Bishop takes g1, rook takes g1, and the queen is hit and should move. It seems that the right square is queen f5, which stays on the light squares and keeps ideas of checking the white king. One major point here is that after knight g5, there is now the move rook takes g5 because this can be a perpetual. As a result, black is doing totally fine here and this position is a draw. Instead, though, Alyekin goes for queen f6, which is at least a bit of an inaccuracy because now knight g5 is possible and you can't play rook takes g5 because of pawn takes. After queen f5 trying to get to the light squares, white is able to play rook e1. There are no checks here, and the three pawns are stronger than the knight. White should win this game. So in the game after knight g5, Alyekin plays rook g7, which I kind of feel had to be played with a bit of a sad heart because it's certainly not the intimidating move. He's had this initiative and momentum, and now he's playing a patient move like rook g7. After rook g7, we do see pawn takes on d7, finally capturing the knight right there. So now rook takes d7, queen e3, rook over to e7 attacking the queen, the knight hops into e6, rook over to f8, and queen e5. Ova says, hey, let's trade queens, but let's fix my pawn structure. And his position is so strong, and there's really no uh, available move for Alyekin that Alyekin has to go for the queen trade. But he does immediately get some counterplay with rook f5 attacking the weak pawn. After rook e1, this is a very interesting position. Obviously, these two connected passers are very, very strong, but they can't easily move right now. If you move the knight, then the e5 pawn falls. If you move the pawn, then the knight falls. So how do you improve this position? Well, it turns out we're never going to get that answer because black should have played here king g8, and then white has to try to slowly improve the position. The things the computer is suggesting is stuff like pawn to b3, and it says that white has a clear advantage. And it certainly looks nice to be white, but white will have to progress very slowly. There's no clear plan to win the game, and I'm not sure if objectively white is winning, though one would definitely pick the white pieces. Alyekin, though, plays a different losing move, pawn to h6. I don't really understand why he selected this move. Obviously, he must not have seen the next move, but h6 obviously seems worse than king g8 to me. The problem with pawn to h6 is that there is now a very pretty refutation. I encourage you to pause your video if you want to try to find it. Well, the right move is knight d8. There's always something pretty about sliding a knight into the opposite rank. And the point here is that now if you take on e5, which has been your whole idea to keep everything blocked in the middle of the board, then we're going to be able to arrange a fork on f7. That's why the king needed to go to g8 and not stay on h8. And of course, white is simply winning. After knight d8, because the pawns are now unshackled, there's just nothing that black can do. So we get rook f2, pawn to e6, rook over to d2, knight to c6, kicking the rook, it falls back, e7, and now you just need to attack this rook and you win the game. b5, knight to d8, king g7, knight b7, the knight is going to d6. After king f6, we get rook e6 check, pushing the, knight, uh, the king away. If this, then you simply have knight d6 check with a fork. So king g5, knight d6 anyway. Rook takes e7, and a bit of a cheeky move to finish things off. Instead of just taking the rook, which Stockfish even says is the quote-unquote best move among many totally winning moves, we get knight to e4 check. And after this cheeky move, Alyekin finally resigned the game. A beautiful game, a real fight. I think that you can feel the tension of the World Chess Championship match 
in this game as there are mistakes and inaccuracies at uh, from both sides throughout but the whole play is exciting and you can just sense the stakes sense the emotions sense the striving from both players playing for the highest stakes that there are in chess I hope that you've enjoyed this game. For more of my favorite chess games of the 1930s, including my mysterious number one game, please do subscribe to the channel and check out the playlist that is popping up on your screen as I speak.